Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is press coverage. The things that are front and center in the press do not always reflect our priorities. They often reflect the priorities of the editors and the publishers. Let's take a look at what was, by all accounts, one historic and newsworthy week. In the span of a few days, there were three blockbuster events, the impeachment trial of a United States president, the announcement of the deal of the century, and the tragic death of a basketball star, Kobe Bryant. That's not the chronological list. Chronologically, it would read impeachment, Kobe Bryant, deal, and impeachment. Depending on where you are and who feeds you your news, you might want to change the order of those events. The order of significance of world events is often determined by location and interest. Almost every news media outlet in the United States pushed the impeachment. It was the beginning, middle, and end of almost every news show and news web page. Newspapers devoted pages, not columns, pages to their coverage. It was overkill, overdone, overwhelming, and overboring. To the chagrin of Israel and lovers of Israel, Donald J. Trump's deal of the century was more like a commercial break than a news item. The deal had been trumpeted for so long and its announcement promised and then postponed so many times that for American audiences, when it was finally unfurled, it became a one-day non-event. Certainly the Israeli press, the Jewish media covered the deal. So did Arabic media, Farsi media, that's from Persia, from Iran. Uh, for those whom, for whom the deal was a big deal, it received worthy coverage. But those audiences were predetermined already. They knew, even before hearing any details, whether they would be nodding in approval or flailing their arms in disagreement and distress. Nobody can predict a helicopter crash. Nobody can predict nine lives ending in a ball of fire. Kobe Bryant's death is a tragedy that wrenched the hearts of Americans. He was a hero, an icon, a father who died on his way to coach his 13-year-old daughter's team after first stopping off at his local church. And his beloved daughter, a budding basketball player, in his image, Gigi died too. The front page stories of head and headlines in three massive national newspapers on Saturday morning, closing out the week, exemplified the interest of American media and the American public. And they are not the same. The New York Times and the Wall Street Journal led with banner headlines announcing the impeachment trial vote, 51 to 41 vote, that determined that no witnesses would be called, and that, in essence, ended the trial. To the uninitiated, they are both elitist newspapers. The New York Post, a politically conservative tabloid, ran a front page picture of rows of seats in the Staples Coliseum, the LA Lakers home court, the team for which Kobe played, draped in basketball jerseys. The jerseys were Kobe's jerseys, LA Lakers number 24. In the corner was a photo of Kobe's close friend and teammate, LeBron James, who had orchestrated the tribute. The Post covered the Senate vote, and covered it in, for many pages, by the way, but it was not their cover story. Their cover story was devoted to the hearts of the New York Post readers, not to their politics. The editors understood that for most Americans, the death of Kobe Bryant usurped their interest in the impeachment and certainly the deal of the century. For elitists, it was impeachment. For Main Street, mainstream America, even in New York City, it was Kobe Bryant. Timing is everything in the news. Tragedy does not accommodate to scheduling issues of politics. Did President Trump choose to announce his deal during the impeachment trial to change the focus of the news coverage? If he did, it didn't work out the way he planned. Even the death of a beloved basketball hero for a week before the Super Bowl, football, uh, the football game of the year, could not sway diehard politicos and Trump-obsessed media from their story. When analyzing the reality and the commitment and the interest of viewers and readers, not of presenters and the media outlets, but the audiences, it appears abundantly clear that when faced with hard, cold politics or heart-wrenching tragedy, tragedy triumphs. The people are much more interested in the human tragedy of one of their heroes than they are in politics of hate or even in the politics of resolving a heretofore unresolvable issue. 
people need to connect to the story. They can relate to Kobe and to his grieving family. They couldn't relate to the impeachment. You and I are interested in the deal, so let's take a closer look at the deal of the century as a news item. Three ambassadors from the Arab world were not just in the room when President Donald J. Trump unfurled his deal of the century. They allowed their presence to be acknowledged and their faces to appear in the international media. Not only did these three Gulf state senior representatives from Oman, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain participate in the event, they listened and even applauded, yes, applauded, in response to the speech delivered by the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. There is only one word to describe the magnitude of these actions. That word is historic. Quite honestly, the actual details of the deal are of less interest than the seismic change in Arab world attitudes towards the Jewish state that was brought front and center because of the deal. The details in the deal will be changed, modified, discussed, and dissected. But no one can ever take away or change the fact that leaders of the Arab world vocally and visually support the deal. Not so very long ago, each time an Israeli got up to speak at the United Nations, all members of the Arab delegation ceremoniously stood up and walked out. This week, that public protest was replaced with support. Arab leaders were given and accepted accolades and compliments were heaped upon their proxies for the roles they played in constructing this plan. I repeat, historic. Of course, there's been blowback in the Arab world from neighboring countries not as supportive of the deal and the plan as those who were in the room with President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu. That's to be expected. But criticism has been muted. And rather than offering up mea culpas for their transgression, the three Gulf states have merely dialed back their enthusiasm a little bit. Rather than total embrace of the plan, they are now explaining that their support of U.S. President Trump's efforts, that's a quote, efforts in bringing about the resolution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The comments stop shy of endorsing the Trump plan, and that's okay. They were there. The Palestinians were not. The absence of the Palestinians when the long talked about and sought after deal slash plan was presented filled the room. Once upon a time, it was the Palestinians who set the tone for the entire Arab world on issues regarding Israel and peace with the Israelis. Now, as was made perfectly clear and painfully obvious, they are not even important players in the process. Should they choose, they can once again become players. But to do that, they need to come to the proverbial peace table. The Trump plan is just a framework, not a deal. Any good deal, like any good contract, is going to ask both sides to compromise. What was presented to the world, Trump and Netanyahu, standing side by side, and the room erupting in applause, is the starting point. There is much to hash out refine, and reject before the deal's application. In order for that to happen, the Palestinians have to do something they have been loath to do since the reign of Yasser Arafat. They must say yes. It's hard for them, but it's the only way they will be able to enter into negotiations and finally achieve internationally recognized statehood and peace with Israel. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas responded to the plan. An ill and aging leader, he said, he does not have long to live and has two choices, to die as a martyr or to die as a traitor. He said, I choose to fight and die as a martyr on the walls of Jerusalem. And now the Palestinians have appealed to the Arab world to not merely reject, but to sabotage the deal. The Palestinians are also counting on Trump losing the election and having this deal fall into the waste bin of history. Counting Trump out is a very reckless prediction. The bigger concern for Palestinians should be what happens when Abbas is no longer there and there is no plan in place, believe me. Given the tensions and the public reactions, it is clear that the Palestinians cannot cooperate with Israel and the United States openly and in public, but they can work on it quietly, behind closed doors, far from the eyes and ears of those who will condemn it. Most accomplishments and progress in the Middle East happen behind closed doors. To be fair, there are some very difficult elements to be ironed out in this plan. The plan is predicated on the Palestinian Authority bringing Hamas in Gaza in line and under their control. That is a difficult undertaking, and Abbas knows it very well. Hamas cannot, under any circumstances, 
or deal or plan or arrangement, have an independent state in Gaza. That would be a three-state solution, not a two-state solution. Hamas successfully ousted Abbas and the Palestinian Authority from Gaza in a bloody, murderous five-day coup from June 10th to June 15th in 2007. That explains why, on the day of the deal, for the first time in a very long time, Abbas and Hamas leaders met to talk. That could not have been easy. Hamas and Palestinian Authority are enemies. They are not friends. As for the elephant in the room, was presenting the plan now an intentional diversion from Trump's impeachment and or Netanyahu's legal woes? The beauty of democracy is that despite the trial, the Trump plan is now out there. And even if Netanyahu was no longer prime minister, Israel's opposition leader, Benny Gantz, was there in the room, and he will continue the process. Most Israelis, the overwhelming majority of Israelis, agree with the Trump plan. The bottom line is cliche. But the reason we have cliches is because they are so true. It takes two to tango. And without both dancers, all we have is the music. Coming up next, points of view. Here's what some important voices have been talking about. I want to discuss two items today. Both are from the Wall Street Journal. First is an editorial, and the second is a traditional column. First up is a Wall Street Journal editorial dated January 29th, 2020, in print, and January 28th, online. It is, of course, authored by the editorial board, and it is titled, Art of the Deal, Palestine Version. Subheadline, by the way, is, Trump's unconventional diplomacy is on display in Israel and the Balkans. The editorial begins by explaining and complimenting the deal. Here we go. From the press coverage of the Trump administration's Middle East peace efforts, led by Jared Kushner, you'd have thought that the White House was going to dismiss Palestinian statehood and ask for no concessions from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Yet the plan described Tuesday at the White House is far more thoughtful. Its thrust is a high-profile endorsement of the two-state solution, and the political implications for Mr. Netanyahu are not yet clear. This is a pro-Israel plan by historical standards. It envisions Palestinians controlling much less territory than they would under the 1967 borders, including as much as 80% of the West Bank. It would not require the evacuation of Israeli settlements in the West Bank. And it demands that Hamas, the terrorist group that controls Gaza, be disarmed. Israel would control the Jordan River Valley. That, it says, is vital to its security on its eastern border. Now, I couldn't agree more. No doubt, the deal is very pro-Israel, and it is historic in that way. Most deals begin by demanding, and have begun, by demanding Israel give, 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 and give more. This deal does not. The editors continue in their editorial, this approach may fail like so many previous efforts, but sometimes unconventional diplomatic methods are worth a try. Last week, the Trump administration contributed to a little-noticed diplomatic breakthrough in the Balkans as Serbia and Kosovo agreed to resume transit between their two countries that has been frozen since the 1990s wars. The Wall Street Journal editors are realistic enough to see that while the deal of the century might fail, it might also succeed. They conclude with the following thought. Stability on Europe's periphery and the Palestinian state, these are hobby horses of the internationalist establishment more than Mr. Trump's populist supporters. Yet critics shouldn't overlook the administration's efforts towards solving them. Now, to the column also, as I said, from the Wall Street Journal. This is a deeply critical and important piece about Human Rights Watch. It is entitled, A Selective Opponent of Settlers. Subheadlined, Human Rights Watch's Sarah Leah Winston has one standard for Israel and another for Armenia. Authored by Eugene Kontrovich and published on January 14, 2020. This is how Kontrovich begins. Hypocritical attacks on Israel are common, but Sarah Leah Winston takes them to a new level. As Middle East and North African director of Human Rights Watch, she is one of the sharpest critics of the Jewish state's presence in the West Bank, promoting boycotts of the international prosecution for the supposed crimes of occupation and settlement. Yet elsewhere, Ms. Winston strongly supports settlements in occupied territories 
suggesting that she and her colleagues don't take their own legal claims against Israel seriously. The author asks how it's possible to be anti-Israel settlement but pro-settlement elsewhere. He explains, the settlement Ms. Winston supports are in Nagorno Kabarka, an area that was within the borders of the post-Soviet Azerbaijan until 1994, when Armenia occupied the region after a protracted war. Since then, the Armenian leadership in Yerevan has actively encouraged a movement of settlers into the area. Many Armenians regard Kabarka as their historic homeland, but the United Nations, international courts, and the United States all consider it occupied Azeri territory. Ms. Winston, who is from an Armenian family, served as Master of Ceremonies in 2018 for a fundraiser for the Armenian National Committee of America, a pro-settler charity that views Kabarka as an integral part of the Armenian homeland. Even as Ms. Winston led Human Rights Watch's campaign to boycott Israeli economic activity in the West Bank, she took to Twitter to promote Armenian wines, including from the occupied territories. Asked about the inconsistencies between their positions, Ms. Winston responded by email, my personal support for Armenian diaspora organizations pertains to their charitable and educational work in Armenia and their efforts to advocate for recognition of the Armenian genocide. Finally, Kontrovich concludes, similarly, the revelations about Ms. Winston will almost certainly not compromise her position at the Human Rights Watch or in the anti-settlement movement. This shows that there is more than a double standard at play. The acceptance of settlement activity by supporters of sanctions on Israel suggests they know that the international law they claim to enforce against the Jewish state is not international law at all. I would agree. If there is any doubt, about the answer? The anti-Israel stance is purely anti-Semitism. There's no question about it. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I'd like to discuss four cartoons today. All of them deal with the Trump peace deal. The first is entitled Trump Peace Plan, and it's by Schott, published in De Volkswagen in the Netherlands. It takes place in a boxing ring. Trump is the referee, and he's holding up Bibi Netanyahu's hand, the hand of the victor holding a trophy which has written on it Trump's peace plan. Abbas is on the ground, and Trump is standing on him with his foot on his head. Enough said. Very clear. Next up is from the Canadian Dale Cummings, and it's called Trump's Deal of the Century, published on January 29, 2020. Trump is standing and holds the head of a dove, which was his mask, under his arm. His legs are talons, so he's dressed as a dove. He's holding the deal of the century in his hand and an olive branch in his mouth. He utters the expression, Midis peace in our time. It's a very dark cartoon, very, very dark. Next up is a cartoon which is less critical and more descriptive. It was published also on January 29th. And again, it's called the same thing, Trump's Deal of the Century. This one is by Dry Bones, Yaakov Kirshen. Trump is in a cloud and handing the deal down to people on Earth. He's getting mixed responses. One shouts, hooray. Another says, what? Another, no way. And another, yippee. This is a realistic approach to the plan, where there are indeed different responses to Trump's Deal of the Century. Last up is a cartoon from Costa Rica. And it's by Arcadio Esquivel. And it's called The Middle East Plan. I suppose it could be Trump's plan, but it's not. It's The Middle East Plan. It's published again on the 29th of January. Trump is saying, fly, fly, as he's throwing off a clearly dead dove with an olive branch in its mouth. The idea is clear. The plan was dead before it even was announced. It's hard to find any cartoons that were positive about the Trump deal. Most poked fun and were extremely critical. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu embarked on a special diplomatic tour. He met with the Muslim leaders of Uganda and Sudan. The most significant Muslim leader on Netanyahu's roster was Abdel Fattah al-Bahran 
of Sudan. And he met him in Uganda itself. It was a dramatic move. Netanyahu's tour was the continuation of the momentum that Israel had been developing over the past few years. It was also extremely troubling, at least for the Palestinians, and especially in the aftermath of the Trump plan, the deal of the century. Just as Netanyahu was on tour of Muslim countries, President Mahmoud Abbas went on his tour. His mission was to garner support for the Palestinian opposition to the plan. Netanyahu's success did not please the Palestinians. PLO Secretary General Dr. Saeb Arikat articulated just how damaging the meeting between the Sudanese leader and Netanyahu was for the Palestinians. He called the meeting between Netanyahu and Sudan's leader, Abdel Fattah al-Bahran, a knife in the back of the Palestinian people. Not even in the heart, in the back. That was a very powerful statement from a very articulate spokesperson for the Palestinians. When analyzing foreign affairs, you can tell much about the situation by looking at who supports and who rejects the initiatives. Sometimes, even without knowing all the details, you can get a good sense of the situation based on who is on whose side. Much like the adage our parents often used about to tell a person, you can tell a person by their friends, right? The deal of the century has gotten the very same interesting supporters and some very typical detractors. Arab leaders from the Gulf states are supporters of the deal. Iran rejects the deal. Supreme leader of Iran has dedicated several speeches to how the deal is no real deal at all. That's a quote. And he said that, quote, Palestine is for the Palestinians, unquote. These are not significant critiques. However, there has been a very significant statement echoed in all of his addresses. The supreme leader of Iran has issued a call for mass resistance Mass resistance is a euphemism for the Intifada. Israel's Air Force struck six targets in Gaza recently. They were all military sites. Many were lookout and observation posts. Since the deal of the century was announced, Hamas has increased its launching of rockets and balloons against Israel. Hamas's objective is to show their anger at the deal. Many of the Hamas-launched rockets were intercepted or fell in remote lo uh, locations. One rocket did, not, did, however, land, and a child and mother were hospitalized for trauma. That is really the objective of Hamas, inflict as much terror and trauma as possible. The Arab League met in an emergency meeting in Cairo. The purpose was to show support for the Palestinians and for the president of the Palestinian Authority, President Mahmoud Abbas as he presented his rejection of United States President Trump's deal of the century. Abbas repeated the message he delivered before. He would not accept any message from Trump, not by phone and not by letter. He did not want Donald Trump to say that the Palestinian president was consulted on the plan. In addition, Abbas cut all ties with the United States and Israel. Diplomatic ties had already been severed. This time, he severed security interaction. Until now, both the CIA and Israel have had very close security links with the Palestinian Authority. Those links have now been cut. I am willing, however, to speculate that those contacts will resume very quietly, probably resume within a week of having been cut, because it is essential. It is necessary for all three sides. They all need to share information to stay safe. And the PA needs it more than the United States and Israel. They need it more than anyone else. Abbas is thinking about his legacy. He has repeated time and time again this past week, before and after the unveiling of the deal, that he will be remembered as the person who betrayed Jerusalem. The other issue he discussed is demilitarization. Abbas said simply, unacceptable. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. I hope you remember one of the cartoons used the expression, Middle East peace in our time. That was a play on British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, who after meeting Hitler, returned to England on September 30th, 1938. Chamberlain said he had achieved peace in our time. He held the document in his hand and his umbrella was over his arm. It was a very, very famous picture. This was a result of the Nazis repudiating post-World War I treaties. He marched into the Sudetenland and united the Germans with the Czechs. This happened on the heels of the Anschluss. 
in March of 1938, when Hitler united Austria with Greater Germany. England was correctly worried that Hitler was expanding and bringing under its control the German lands that had been specifically separated as a result of the embarrassing defeat of World War I. Interestingly, Chamberlain borrowed the expression from the Earl of Beaconsfield, a.k.a. also known as Benjamin Disraeli, the Jewish Prime Minister of Great Britain, the person responsible for the remarkable expansion of the United Kingdom. In Disraeli's case, he was returning from the Congress of Berlin in 1870 when he announced, I have returned from Germany with peace in our time. He said it first. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.